Welcome to Mr. Woods Teaches Middle School Math Survival Guide. I'm Fred Woods, ready to teach. Hi middle schoolers, this is Mr. Woods, and today we're going to be working on 8th grade end of year mathematics. It's going to be a series of five videos. Today is the first one. You may be asking, why are we starting with the end of the year? Well, this is what your goal is, and then I'm going to go back and start with your basics, what you should know after elementary school and entering 6th grade, and we're going to work all the way up to end of year of 8th grade. By the end of the year, you should have a really good understanding of these conversions. Most of the time for the conversions, you might get the inches to meters or miles and stuff like that, but don't rely on it. Try to have this memorized by the time you're at the end of your in 8th grade. You should already have a lot of this done for the measurement that you had. I know that you had it in 5th grade all the way up through and you're going to continue seeing it into high school and then college and beyond. Here are some formulas you should have memorized. Now many times there might be a teacher that will put this into the test. However, you're going to have to understand what all this is. It's not may not have all of this information here like in this triangle. It may not show, say, hey, this is H, but it might give you a value. It may not say this is B, which is the base and such. So you need to understand that there's different formulas for different reasons. So this is area, A is area, C is circumference, A is area, V is volume. I love this one, 4 thirds pi r cubed. That gives it away right there is because volume is always cubic. And then you should have the basic Pythagorean theorem down. And then others like the right circular cone and the right circular cylinder and general prisms. Notice how I said general prisms because this is true for others. So it could be rectangular, hexagonal. There, there's so many different others that you can have for general prisms. Let's take a look at this first practice problem here. So what I'm looking at is something here. This is telling me it, it might be something that has to do with scientific notation. And then I see it right here, scientific notation. So I need to understand and know how to apply scientific notation. So here, we already have it in meters, okay? And I'm looking for it. I need to put it in scientific notation. Again, it's going to be a number multiplied by 10 to raised to a certain power. So if I look here, I see there's that decimal point. And all I need to do is just go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then 6. I want to move it right there. So how many did I move it over? I move it over 6. Is it this? Is it 10 to the 6? No, that's going in the other direction. I'm going to, where I'm going into 1s, 10s, 100s, 1000s, and such like this. But this is 10 millionths. And we don't do it as 71, which, so I can just say, eh, we can't do that. Can't do this one. And since I'm going to the right with that decimal point, it's going to be a negative value for my exponent, so there's that. So A is my answer, and I'm going to stick to it. You can work it out. You can go through and go, well, wait a minute, 7.1 times 10 to the negative 6, and you're going to find out that's going to be multiplied times 10 to the negative 6, which is actually going to be underneath here, which is 10 to the 6. I'm not going to do that math. If you want to pause this to make sure and to verify and validate that, that that I'm correct, you can do that. Number two. Now this is where reading comprehension comes in to these problems. I mean, all problems that you're going to have when you have words in it, you have to understand what it's saying. But this is especially for this one here. When I first looked at it, I'm like, well, wait a minute, what are we looking for? And I had to figure it out. This figure is made up of a cube with a square pyramid on top. So here's my cube right here. And notice how the base of this pyramid is square. So a cube is square on each side, so those are all equal. This base is the same for the pyramid is the same size as one of the sides of the or facets of the cube. A vertical plane that's perpendicular to the base of both shapes and passes through point W slices the figure into halves that are equal. So I can look at this and go, okay, let me try to figure this out. And it's going through point W there. So that's, I'm going to say that's approximately right here. So I get a decent idea of what, what I'm looking at here. I'm going, oh, okay. So it's going to slice it up. So I'm going to draw a picture. So it's going to have this slice 
goes like this and comes down here. And same thing here. It's going to come up. And then it's going to go up like that. My figure is going to look like this, approximately. <laughs> I'm going to try to get it a little bit better. So this is my, if I look at this, this is the top of the piece here, which is my pyramid, but it's going to have a cross section that looks like this. That's what we're looking at. This is a cross section. And I'm not going to have this piece right here going across. I was just drawing that to show you that it's part of the pyramid there. But it says, what is the shape generated by half of the three-dimensional shape when pulled apart and looking at the cross section? There's that word cross section. And that's what's this right here. Is it square? Well, we do have a square. A pentagon, well, what's, hold on a second, it's definitely not a triangle, definitely not a hexagon. It has a square in it, but it's not that. Just by eliminating the different choices, and pentagon is five sides. One, two, this is three, this is four, and this is five. Yep, so there's definitely five sides to that. So this is my answer. Is Pentagon. Notice how I had to go through here and I was looking at it going, what do I have to do? And I started working on it, doing this cross section. I'm drawing it out to try to figure out and visualize what I'm doing. And then I came back and went, oh, wait a minute, it does say cross section. So have, you have to understand the academic language for eighth grade math to be able to solve this. Number three, there's a lot of things going on here and you have to understand the academic language behind this. Let's take a look. Number three, a function has the following properties. Well, first, you need to understand what a function is. Let's continue reading. It is increasing and linear. Okay, what does increasing and linear mean? When the value of x is between negative 6 and 3. Okay, it remains constant. Now, what does that mean? Constant when the value of x is between negative 3 and 1. It is decreasing and linear when the value of x is between 1 and 2, and it is increasing and nonlinear when the value of x is between 2 and 6. So there's a lot of things here. You have to understand this language, and you have to understand what they're talking about between negative 6 and 3 and 2 and 6. Then the question is, which graph best represents this function? So there's a function here, and we have like a function. You know, we have function of x, and what is that? Well, I don't know what it is. However, I know that they're talking about x and it's and such. And it's going to equal something. You know, it could have a, a number sentence here, or it could be uh, some sort of a linear or nonlinear equation, or it could be a linear and nonlinear. So, but what does that mean? Well, let's take a look. It is increasing in linear when the value of x is between negative 6 and 3. Well, x is here. This is x. That's one thing you need to understand, and why, to orient you to this coordinate grid. So negative 6 and negative 3. Oh, there it is. Well, look at that. Negative 6 and negative 3. So that's increasing. That means that it's, it's gaining value. So that looks good. Okay. It remains constant when the value of x is between negative 3 and 1. There's negative 3 and 1. Oop, look at that. Okay. And then... It's decreasing in linear, okay, between 1 and 2, so there's 1 and 2. That's talking about x, and it is increasing in nonlinear. Oops, well, I'm going to give this away. That is a linear, that is linear, so it cannot be a. Let's look at b. Same thing, does it match this pattern here? Increasing, constant. And it, oh, it's supposed to be decreasing, so it can't be that one, because if I look at that, that this piece right here, because this, this was okay. A C, oh, there's a curve, that's nonlinear, curves are nonlinear, so just by eliminating all these different things, it, ha it should be this one here. So let's take a look, between negative 6 and 3, so here's negative 6 and 3, it's increasing, check. It's constant between negative 3 and 1, check. It is decreasing between 1 and 2, check, and increasing and nonlinear between 2 and 6. There we go, check. So my answer is D. See how vocabulary and understanding what that academic vocabulary 
means is essential for eighth grade math. Plus, when you know this and you go into high school, this will be a great advantage that you're going to have at the beginning of the year. Number four, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Don't be afraid. You need to have the ability to take the words, understand those words, look here what they're trying to find and understand what they're trying to find, and then also note that this is a table. So that's definitely a table. And there's a couple of things here. He's giving me some numbers here, total amount paid and such. And, and I'm going, okay, what does that mean? Well, I'm going to come over here and we're going to read this. We're going to read it a few times. Mr. Anakin made an initial deposit of $1,500 when purchasing a car. After the initial deposit, he paid the same amount of money each month. The table shows the total amount of money, A, he paid for the car after a certain number of months, T, since he started making payments. So right here, I'm going, oh, this must be the number of months. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call that T right here. So let's reread it. Mr. Anakin made an initial deposit. So here's my initial deposit when purchasing a car. After, so this is after, let me put, I'm just going to underline that, after the initial deposit, he paid the same amount of money each month. Let's circle that. The table, which is right here, shows the total amount of money A. Oh, this is total amount of money A. Here's my A. He paid for the car after a certain number of months, T, since he started making payments. We know that he has his money, and after a certain number of months, T, since he started making payments. Choose the equation that models the relationship between A and T. Well, first off, he paid $1,500. So it's like, well, okay, these all have, well, these three have $1,500 in it. I'm going to take this out because we have to know that it's going to include that initial deposit. I'm going to assume this is months. Okay, so I'm going to say T is months. I'm just going to put an M O N there. So months. He started out with $1,500. And then, so this is going to be 1500 and he added, uh, looks like another 1000 so 1000 And it was divided by four months, divided by four. So that's going to be 1500 And I'm going to, ooh, he added $1,000. And now what's 1,000 divided by 4? Well, half of 1,000 is 500, and then another half of that is 250. So that's 250. Okay, so I'm going, okay, it's going to be $1,500 plus $250 each month. So let's see here. And that month is T. So 250t plus 1500 right here and I know it's not that one because I have to add something this one is reversed we're not adding $1500 per month because that's that T in months we're not doing that and we didn't this is in our initial adjustment so I sit in here I'm going to I'm going to do this so let's take a look let's look at it at 10 months so if I say a is equal to 250 and then T is 10 plus 1,500. What is that going to be? Well, I'm just continue on here. 2, 5, 0, 0. Because all I'm doing is multiplying by 10. I'm just adding a 10 plus 1500. OK, and that equals, so I know 500 plus 500 is another 1,000, so it's going to be 2,000 plus 2,000, that's going to be 4,000. And I just validated this uh, right here using this equation, so therefore that's my final answer. Number five, match the statement to the equation y equals x squared plus 5. Once again, so this statement, this equation, so here's this equation. 
we have to understand what this is. A, the function is nonlinear because there are two variables. Well, is that nonlinear? I know that when y is equal to x squared, I get something called a parabola. Something like that. Now, and of course, this is my x and this is my y arrows in on there because it keeps going on and on. Is it, it well it's nonlinear because this is definitely not linear. Remember linear is a straight line because there are two variables. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. The function is linear. Well it can't be that one because it's definitely not linear. The function is nonlinear. There we go because the variable x is raised to the power of 2. Okay. The function is linear. Now, so when I look at this, I'm going the function line because there are two variables. Does it matter if there's two variables? Uh, no. One is a dependent variable and the other one. Okay, no, I don't think it's this one here. The function is linear, nonlinear because the variable x is raised to the power of 2. And that's correct. So definitely this one here because it is nonlinear and the variable x is raised to the power of 2. And I showed that here with this parabola is non being non-linear. And that's my knowledge of how to plot coordinates. Thank you very much. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe, and watch the next four videos. Remember, this is a series of five. Have a great day.